So beginning in verse 27, Jesus says, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. Hmm. I guess I went one more verse, didn't I? All right. Well, may the Lord again bless his word to us um, this evening. Now this morning, again, we saw what Jesus was going through because his hour had come. He was struggling with the agony that he was about to face in bearing our sins. But we were also looking to the things that Jesus was looking at that helped him push through uh, the pain barrier, you might say, this ultimate pain barrier. Uh, several considerations. First of all, that this was his purpose. This was why he came. Uh, he came into the world to lay down his life in order that he might draw all men to himself. Um, that was the purpose he came for, so that is what he was intent on carrying out. He remembered the Father was with him to help him. He wasn't going to leave him alone to do it on his own. He knew that his Father loved him even when he was on the cross, even when he was suffering. He remembered the hand that was striking him it was a hand that loved him. It wasn't for his sins because he had none, but for the sins of his people whom he was or which he was bearing for them. And we saw that his father who called him to suffer such shame promised that he would reward him by honoring him publicly. And he did that as we saw in the text this morning by speaking out of heaven even as he did at his baptism but also he will do so in heaven because he has given Jesus the honor of judging all men. Those who hated Jesus, those who rejected him, are one day going to have to stand before him and be judged by him. And those who loved him will be received by him into glory. Now we, all, we also saw that we can take these same things and we can apply them to our own lives in order to help us also uh, push through the pain barrier. Whenever we're struggling to do what the Lord has called us to do, we can remember Jesus' example, that we too have a purpose. Uh, we were created and saved, that we might reach out to others. By the way, we didn't mention this this morning, but we should think about it, that the commission the Lord has given to us is really a commission uh, to do the greatest work that has ever taken place in human history. We think about how people are honored by great military exploits, being great kings, being great humanitarians, being great athletes, being great actors or singers. All these things one day are going to be forgotten, but the one thing that will not be forgotten is what one does for Jesus, what one does for the Lord. This is the greatest work that anyone could ever do, and the Lord has entrusted it to us that we might take the gospel out to others in order that souls might be saved. This is real, and we need to see it as real. We need to be reminded by Jesus' example that we are not left on our own to do this. Jesus said he would be with us, that he would help us even to the end. 
that he would continue to love us even if the whole world turned against us. And again, we saw how that gave Athanasius the strength to continue to stand in the truth even though the world appeared to turn against him and to turn against uh, the most important truth that Jesus is in fact uh, very God of very God. And that even though the Lord may call us to experience a measure of public shame, even as our Lord Jesus Christ uh, was humiliated and shamed, uh, after all, identifying ourselves as Christians in a world like this isn't exactly going to enhance our image in the eyes of others. If we are willing to identify ourselves as Christians, the Lord will publicly honor us, I think, in this world and also in the world that is coming. Now we also saw secondly what Jesus was going to do or what was going to happen to this world because Jesus' hour had come. He said Satan's dominion was going to be broken. Satan was going to be cast out. He would no longer be able to keep the nations under darkness, to keep them in ignorance, to keep them in sin, to keep them away from the gospel. Jesus, when he was lifted up, would begin to draw all men to himself because the ruler of this world would be cast out. We also saw that when Jesus would do his work, the middle wall that was separating the Jews and Gentiles would be torn down. You know, it's interesting, the temple itself was actually torn down in 70 AD so that that wall was broken down, uh, literally. But that figure, that wall basically, which was a figure of that separation, was also broken down. There's no longer a distinction between Jew and Gentile, but all who love the Lord and trust in the Lord and turn from their sins and follow the Lord are certainly welcome to Him. And they all become part of the same body and they all become part of the same bride and the Lord loves them all the same. Well, with this door now wide open to all men, we may invite everyone to come. There's no one that we may not invite. And of course, if we want, and I think we should, if we look at it the same way that Spurgeon did as we look at the word and see the promise that God has made that he intends to save a multitude of people a group so large that no one can number them then we can have the confidence that not only is it possible for people to be saved but people actually are going to be saved through our testimony through our witness all this would be the result of Jesus death on the cross but now we move on to the next section. When the Jews heard what Jesus had to say about his being lifted up and they understood that that meant his dying, they didn't understand. Now that shouldn't surprise us, of course, because there's a number of things that they did not understand regarding the Messiah. And again, we have to be careful that we don't too harshly judge them because you know, we've had all this instruction. We have the New Testament that explains the Old Testament. All they had was the Old Testament. And they didn't understand. Oftentimes the disciples didn't understand as well. Now they thought, as we saw before, that Messiah's kingdom was going to be a political kingdom. It was going to, he was basically coming to overthrow the Romans and set them free and to reestablish basically Israel as a kingdom. Now in a certain sense that's true, but not in the sense that they were thinking. But now here is another misunderstanding. They believe that once Messiah came, that he was coming to rule over Israel forever. That he was not going to die, but this was going to go on basically for the rest of time. Now again, this is true in one sense, but not in the sense in which they were thinking. So tonight I want us to consider basically three things from this text. First of all, their confusion over what Jesus said. Uh, secondly, Jesus' explanation of, um, you know, basically what was going to happen with regard to the Messiah, why he came. And then thirdly, how we can apply what he says in both cases. Now, first of all, let's look at their confusion. They thought Messiah was here to stay. They thought Messiah could not die. In verse 34, the crowd then answered him, we have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. 
And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Now they said that they had heard that the Christ is to remain forever. And where did they hear that? They said they heard it out of the law. And actually as you look into the, uh, the Old Testament, we find that it's not necessarily in the Pentateuch, which is normally what's referred to as the law, uh, but it's in the writings and the prophets. Now, why did they use the, the term law? Well, because sometimes it's a term that can be expanded to refer to the whole testament. Uh, there's differing ways of describing the Old Testament, and basically law is one way to describe the whole thing. Now, what exactly did the Lord say in the law regarding the Messiah that brought about this confusion? Well, he said essentially this, that when Messiah came, he would remain forever. Uh, this is what the Lord said in the Psalms. Uh, we read in Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, they knew this psalm was referring to the Messiah. They knew this psalm was saying that Messiah, when he came, would be a king but he would also be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He would be a king and a priest. Something was quite rare, actually, he'd be a prophet as well. He would be like Moses. He would be like David, both of which basically had, it seems like they were exercising all three of these offices. I think Moses certainly was, and David perhaps is a type of Christ. But I want you to notice that it also says that he would occupy these offices forever. He would live forever. We read in Psalm 45, which was the psalm we used for the call to worship this evening, in verse 2. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Again, understanding Messiah's coming, that he would be there forever. And then in Psalm 72, verse 17. May his name endure forever. May his name increase as long as the sun shines and let men bless themselves by him. Let all nations call him blessed. You know, one thing the Jews believed because it, you know, it was in the Old Testament that the creation was going to stand forever. Now they didn't understand certain things about that. They didn't understand that God was going to basically destroy this creation, purify it with fire, bring it back together in a uh, purified creation, be purified from all sin. And in the same way they didn't understand that even though the Messiah was coming and he was going to remain forever, that it wasn't just going to be a sort of straightforward coming and remaining. There were other things that had to take place. Now there were also indications in the prophets that Messiah would reign forever. We read in Ezekiel 37 verse 25. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob my servant in which your fathers lived and they will live on it. They and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David my servant will be their prince forever. Now in the Old Testament oftentimes when it's saying that David is going to do this or David is going to do that, it's talking about not David but David's son, his greater son. He would be their prince forever. So they would have this land, they would possess this land and Messiah would rule over them forever. Was that a straightforward promise that was going to be fulfilled in this world, in this, basically in this creation? No, but this is looking beyond that to perhaps the eternal state where the Lord was going to fulfill that to his spiritual seed, the spiritual seed of Abraham who were going to be ruled over forever by David's greater son. So the question is, why does Scripture say that Messiah is going to remain forever when Jesus just told them that he must die? Well, it's because that's not all the law had to say. The law also talked about other things regarding the Messiah. The Jews were basically guilty of doing the very thing that many Christians do today, and that is reading the Bible selectively, just looking for the things they want to see and not really taking the whole of what it has to say. We need to make sure that we don't fall into that trap as well. We need to make sure we read the whole Bible and let the Lord tell us what we are to believe and not believe. 
and how we are to live and not to live. Now the Lord also said in the Old Testament that the Messiah would die and he would rise again. David writes in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10, I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Again, I believe uh, Peter quoted this very psalm when he was preaching on the day of Pentecost to prove that the Messiah was to suffer, he was to die, he was to be raised again from the dead. The psalmist also writes in Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Again, this is speaking about the death and resurrection of the Messiah. Now again, we need to be careful that we aren't too hard on these Jews because the disciples, our Lord's followers, appeared to have the same misunderstanding, even those that were closest to him. We read in Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23, how when Jesus announced the fact that he was going to die, that Peter stood to his face and rebuked him and said, that can't happen. We read in verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Now again, I do think uh, Peter and the apostles believed that Jesus came to restore the kingdom to Israel. And they even asked him after his resurrection, Lord, is it now that you're going to do what it is we're expecting you to do? And, uh, and again, as we're going to see this evening, Jesus didn't just answer their question, but instead he told them what it is they needed to do because that was not his intention to establish an earthly political kingdom and to overthrow the Romans and to remain there as king forever. There was a much greater goal. The two on the road to Emmaus said to Jesus when he asked them uh, what they were talking about, they said this, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, that's what we're talking about, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Again, they had this hope, they had this expectation, but it was a false one. Jesus had redeemed Israel, but they didn't understand that idea of a suffering Savior, of a dying Savior, of a resurrected Savior, and of a kingdom that was not just over the land of Israel, but over the entire world. Now, because the Jews believed that Messiah couldn't die, they thought Jesus must be speaking about someone else when he said the Son of Man must be lifted up. They at least understood what he meant by that. Lifted up, he had to die. We read in John 12, verse 34, we have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Now again, I think the idea here is that Jesus, when he referred to the Son of Man being lifted up, the Son of Man must have been someone else other than the Messiah because Messiah certainly can't die. He's come down to do this particular work. He's come down to reign forever. But I want you to notice that Jesus, as I just mentioned a moment ago, didn't answer their question directly and try to explain it all to them again. But instead, he told them what they should do while he was still with them, before he was lifted up. So second, we see Jesus' explanation to their question. Rather than telling them again that he must die and rise, he, st he says instead, that they should make the best use of the time and opportunity they had remaining to learn from him, that they might believe him, 
and follow him. Time was running out, and so they should use their time wisely. Jesus says in verse 35, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. Now again, Jesus speaking in this figurative language, which we find often in the Gospel of John. Uh, what is he talking about here? Well, we saw from uh, our meditation this evening and what Jesus says in other parts of John's Gospel that the light is referring to him. Uh, we read in John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then in chapter 9, verse 5, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light. He says he was only going to be with them, or the light was only going to be with them a little while longer. We understand there were only now a few days before he would be crucified. And so they should walk while they have that light. In other words, they should listen to him. Listen to his teaching. Walk in his ways. Do what he says. If they did, the darkness would not overtake them. Now darkness in scripture is a metaphor that represents ignorance. The darkness of ignorance, it's, it refers to the darkness of moral evil or sin. And basically Jesus was saying that if they rejected him, they would fall back into darkness. Now that's what they were in when Jesus first came to them. Their situation, if they didn't listen to Jesus now that he had, that he had come, would be even worse for them if they had never seen or heard them. He says basically, believe, you know, walk in the light while you have the light so that you don't fall back into darkness. You know, this is exactly what Jesus meant when he warned earlier, interestingly, from the same chapter we were looking at this morning in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. He says this, Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man and passes through waterless places, seeking rest and does not find it, then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Jesus said this in the context of, again, they're accusing him of casting out demons by the prince of demons. So basically, Jesus comes into an atmosphere of darkness. That's how it's described, I believe. It's in Matthew chapter 4. Those who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. The light comes into the darkness, and through his light, through his ministry, he drives the darkness out of Israel at least for a time. That's what all these, you know, casting out of demons and healing and all the teaching, uh, that's what it was doing, bringing light to Israel. But Jesus is warning here that those who do not receive him after having seen him, after having heard his teaching, those who don't receive him would fall into a greater darkness once he was gone. Jesus is warning them against this. Jesus said that those who sin against a greater knowledge, those who are blessed to know uh, more than other people know, but don't believe or receive that knowledge, will also have to face a severer judgment. Not only will their condition be worse in the end, but their judgment will be worse. Jesus said to his disciples before he sent them out to teach and preach in Matthew 10, verses 14 and 15, Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words as you go out of that house or out of that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. You see, having greater privilege, if you sin against greater light, there's greater punishment. 
If you're in darkness, when the light comes to you and you begin to experience some of the uh, benefits of that light as we see in Hebrews chapter 6, but we end up rejecting that light and not receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, we end up in a state worse than the first. Our hearts are even harder. We're even further from the grace of God. And if we never repent and trust in Him, judgment will be severe. Now, if this is true, how could they escape? Well, Jesus said they needed to believe in Him. They needed to trust Him. Jesus says as much in verse 36, but, but I want you to notice that He says even more than just that they need to. He urges them to believe because Jesus didn't want them to die in their sins, but to be saved through Him. He says in verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Jesus wanted them to be saved. You know, Jesus didn't take any delight in the fact that they rejected him, even though he knew that the majority of them were, that he was going to be handed over to be crucified. He wept over Jerusalem when he considered what was coming upon them and lamented that they didn't receive him. And we see something of that here as he's basically pleading with them, while I'm here. Believe in me so that you may become the children of God. Now after this, Jesus left. He spoke these things and then he went away and hid himself from them. And why did he do that? Well, as we're going to see in the next section, they still didn't believe in him. So after all Jesus said, after all Jesus did, they still refused to believe and they were going to fall under that condemnation that he had warned. And that's what 70 AD was really all about. God's judgment on the Jews for their rejection of Jesus Christ. Greater light, greater judgment, you know, greater responsibility, greater punishment. So we've seen the Jews' confusion. We've seen Jesus' explanation. Let's just consider finally how we can apply this. Now, one thing we need to consider is that the things that Jesus said to these Jews, he said to them in his day, and these things had direct application to them in, in his day. But there are still some principles here that I think that we can apply to ourselves. And the first thing I think we can do is, is basically make sure that we don't fall into the same category that the Jews did, uh, or even the disciples and becoming confused about Jesus, uh, about who he is, about what he's done, about what it is he wants us to do. Now we saw the Jews were mistaken about what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to overthrow the Romans. He came to overthrow that which was far more dangerous. He came to overthrow sin and to set his people free from sin. That meant he was going to have to die. They were also confused about how he was going to do this. They thought he was going to sit on David's throne. He was going to sit on that throne forever. But that's not what was going to happen. He, was, he came to die. He would be raised. And then he would ascend to the throne of heaven from which he would rule and reign forever. Now that confusion was one of the many reasons they did not believe him or follow him. You see, we have to know the truth, don't we? If we're going to follow Jesus, we have to have the truth. We have to have the right Jesus. We have to understand what it is that Jesus did, we need to understand what he calls us to do. Now, as we think about all these different things, about all the different areas where we could feasibly become confused about Jesus and his work, I mean, there's so many of them that we couldn't possibly name them all. But let me just mention three basic things that we need to get right. Who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he wants us to do. Now in today's world, you know there's a lot of false Christs. There's the Christ or the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses, there's the Jesus of the Mormons, there's the Jesus of Islam, and they are not the same Jesus. And there are many others that we could mention. We need to make sure that we get the right one, we need to make sure we get the real one, the one who is the Son, the Eternal Son, of the Triune God. The one who became a man, who was born of a virgin. So one who possesses two natures. That really sets the Jesus of the Bible apart from all the other Jesuses. If you were to compare them, you'd find they fall short. 
Now we need to make sure that we understand what Jesus has done for our salvation. That he lived and he died in order to fulfill the requirements for our salvation. To fulfill what we call the covenant of redemption. That agreement that was made with the Father in eternity where Jesus would come down and he would guarantee to us who believed that those conditions would be met for us so that we would enter into heaven. So all we would have to do is simply believe in him and receive him as our Lord and Savior. And if we did, we would not perish in hell, but have eternal life. Now that is what he has done, and that is received by faith alone. Now that again sets us apart from all other religions. But we also need to make sure that we're not confused, but we understand what Jesus wants us to do. And that's something that we've been focusing on quite a bit lately. The Lord wants us to be his ambassadors. The Lord has given us a personal commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. Now he doesn't mean for each of us to do all that work ourselves. This is something he has entrusted to his entire church. But we all have our part to play. We all have those people we need to reach. But of course to do this we, have, we first need to be disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to become like the Lord Jesus, to live like him. And then we must go and share the gospel with others. Remember, our lives must be consistent with the message. Otherwise, we're going to undercut the message with our lives. But as his ambassadors, we go and we share the gospel with others so that they too might become disciples and become his ambassadors. This is the work he has called us to do. Let's not get confused. If we get confused in any of these areas, we either are not going to be saved if we get the wrong Christ and don't understand his work and know how to receive it or we're going to be entirely neutralized uh, by not actually doing what the Lord calls us to do again I think so many so many times we get the impression that all he wants us to do is believe just believe and that's it believe in the Lord Jesus Christ you should be saved and that's all I do then I just go on and I live my life the way I want to live it and I do what I want to do and I just live like the rest of the world and I've done all I need to do, but that's not the way it works. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we die and we begin to follow him. We are raised again to life in order to follow him, to do his will, to be his ambassadors, to be those living epistles, to be like Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be little Christ, to be like the one who is the Christ. So we don't want to get confused, that's the first thing. And the second one is, from what we've seen here, is basically this. Jesus was telling them they needed to make the most of their opportunity while he was there. That they should take advantage of the few remaining days that they have with him. That they should listen to him. That they should follow him, that they should believe in him in order that they might become the sons of light. If they were blessed to have all that light and they fell back into the darkness, remember it would be much worse for them than if they had never heard it. So how can we apply that? Well, I think we need to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunity that Jesus has given us as well in a different number of different areas, remembering that opportunities don't last forever. Let's think first of all, about the opportunities that the Lord has given us to reach other people. Because I think that's a very important point. There, there are people that we have the opportunity to reach now, right now, that one day we're not going to be able to reach because it's going to be too late. You know, either our relationship with them is going to end, it's going to fail so that we're not going to have a bridge to cross anymore in order to talk with them, or they're going to die or we're going to die and that will be the end of our opportunity then to minister to them. So while we have the opportunity, again realizing these opportunities are limited, they are finite in number, one day they're going to run out. Let's try to redeem them. Let's try to reach out to them. Let's tell them about Christ. Having told them, let's water that seed by encouraging them to come to Christ. 
As much as it lies upon us, let's try to not let anyone that we know around us, and even people we don't know, let's try to build bridges to them, let's not allow anyone to leave this world without hearing the gospel. Because if they do, they're lost forever. There's, there's no hope for them. Now, we, we want to believe there's always going to be another opportunity, and I think sometimes it's that belief that makes us not take advantage of the ones that we have. But we do need to understand that opportunities come to an end. There isn't always tomorrow. Suddenly, it can be too late. We need to make sure that we take advantage of it while we have it. That's what Paul says when he means when he says, let's buy up the opportunities. Let's redeem the time. Let's make the most of what it is the Lord has given us to do. But the second, I think, and more obvious application of this is one that has to do with any here this evening that haven't actually received the Lord Jesus Christ because that was the situation these Jews were actually in. Jesus was telling them, while the light is here, Listen to the light, follow the light, walk in the light, receive it, believe in it, believe in Him. You need to understand that your opportunities to receive the Lord Jesus Christ aren't going to go on forever. One day they're all going to be gone as well. You don't know how long you're going to live. Uh, you may die unexpectedly. Or maybe you'll reject it just one time too many. And then your heart will become too hard and the Lord may no longer offer that gospel to you. That is possible. We can so grieve and quench God's spirit and so resist him that he gives us over forever. Now the Lord says if that happens to you, it would have been far better for you never to have heard the gospel than having heard it to reject it. As we've already seen, judgment will be more severe for those who sin against greater light. But I do want you to see from our text this morning, or this evening, if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, what he says. He says in verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. While you have the gospel, while you're in a church where it's being preached, while you're in a family that actually believes it and lives it and communicates it to you, reach out and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. That is his express will. That's what he wants. That's what he wants you to do. To reach out and receive him so that you may become a child of light and an heir of heaven and not fall back into the darkness. You know, I think it, it does make a difference that our, our Lord's heart, his disposition towards you, is that he wants you to come to him and be saved. The Lord is not holding anyone back. The only thing that holds us back is our own hearts because we don't want him. But Jesus says if you want him, he's there. He wants you to come, receive him, trust him, and be saved. Well, let's, let's bow in just, again, a few moments of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our hearts. See you